Were the Allies worried that D-Day would fail? You bet they were. D-Day is completely unique in military history. Nothing else like it has ever been attempted. Amphibious assaults are the hardest, the most virtuosic of military undertakings. The Allies were going to attempt one on a scale incomparable to anything ever done before. In one day, 150,000 men were going to cross the Channel and try desperately to secure a foothold in France. Lying in wait was a formidable array of defences, Hitler's Atlantic War. The men would have to overcome mines, machine guns and much more before they could secure a beachhead. Many men would be going to their deaths. In hindsight, we know what happened on D-Day. It was an enormous success, the first step on the path to liberating France. It's easy to forget that that wasn't guaranteed. Many of the commanders actually had grave doubts about what they were doing. Some thought that the casualties would be unacceptably high. Others thought that it would fail completely. In this video, I want to go through all the things they were worried about, from the weather driving the men off course to a particularly threatening group of panzer divisions. Before we can do that, though, let's have a look at what the Allies were up against, Hitler's formidable Atlantic Wall. France famously fell to Nazi Germany in only six weeks in 1940. If you would like to learn more about that, I've already made a video all about why France collapsed so fast. The defeat of France was, of course, an incredible achievement for Nazi Germany. However, given that they were unable to conquer Britain, there was always the risk that it would be used as a launch pad for an Allied invasion. To prevent that, Hitler ordered that the coastline be made into an impenetrable fortress. It was a huge project. He wanted to fortify the entire coastline all the way from the south of France to the top of Norway. By May of 1944, almost 10,000 concrete bunkers had been built along the coastline. Those bunkers were made of reinforced concrete and were resistant to almost anything the Allies could throw at them. In total, 17 million cubic metres of concrete were used, enough for 85 modern-day skyscrapers. On the beaches in front of those bunkers were an assortment of lethal defences. Miles and miles of barbed wire that would tangle up enemy infantry, leaving them easy targets for machine guns. Many of the defences were cheap and simple, designed merely to be obstructions. There were anti-tank defences, known as Czech hedgehogs. Any tank that tried to drive over one would be raised off the ground and immobilised. A similar role was played by concrete pyramids and large steel gates. Germany also laid a huge number of mines. There were 6.5 million in Normandy alone. The most terrifying were mines that jumped into the air before they exploded. Known as S-mines, when they were trodden on, they would be launched a metre into the air before exploding a lethal spray of shrapnel in all directions. The detonation of a single mine could kill numerous men. There were also dangers lurking in the sea. Anti-tank mines were placed on wooden poles and driven into the sand. When it was high tide, they would be underwater, just below the waves. If an infantry carrier hit one of them, the mine would blow up and sink the vessel. Overall, the defences made an invasion extremely difficult. Their main purpose was to delay the enemy, keep them tied down on the beaches until a counterattack could be launched. Inland, there were reinforcements ready, including 10 tank divisions, ready to push the Allies back into the sea. So, the Allies had a formidable challenge on their hands. Amphibious assaults are said to be the hardest operations in all of warfare. To pull one off against such defences would be extremely difficult. It would involve millions of people playing all manner of different roles. One of the reasons that the Allies were so worried was due to an attempted amphibious landing two years earlier at the town of Dieppe. The Allies had expected the element of surprise to be sufficient to win the battle, but it turned out to be a spectacular failure. They didn't survey the beaches' gradient and geology, didn't plan well their routes inland from the beaches, and didn't know enough about the German fortifications. Miscommunication between the men at sea and on land led to landing craft being sent in when there was no space on the beach. 29 tanks did land, but they were barely able to move due to the loose surface on the beach. Of the 10,000 men involved, around 3,000 were killed or taken prisoner. Overall, it had been a disaster. Now, two years later, the Allies were determined to avoid making the same mistakes again. First, they had to decide on a landing site. Theoretically, they could have landed anywhere from the south of France to the top of Norway, but for logistical and air support reasons, it couldn't be too far from Britain. 
Any landing zone needed to be within range of their fighter planes. The obvious place would have been Calais, since it was the closest to Britain. It would have been the easiest to provide air support and offered the most direct route into Germany. However, because it was the obvious target, it had been heavily fortified. Another possibility was Normandy. Normandy had wide, deep beaches that would be perfect for landing men and materiel. It was within fighter range and provided an excellent harbour to which the Allies could ship supplies and reinforcements. However, a huge amount of research had to be done to determine whether it was suitable. The Royal Air Force did over 3,000 reconnaissance trips to photograph the beaches. The Allies wanted to know about every inch of the terrain. What was the gradient of the beach? What were the German defences? What were the routes to get inland? In all those respects, Normandy was judged suitable. British citizens were even asked to send in their holiday photos from France so that planners could reconstruct the terrain. Another crucial question was what type of sand it had. Remember, in the Dieppe raid two years earlier, the loose shingle had left many of the Allied tanks unable to move. That absolutely couldn't happen again. The sand had to be capable of bearing the weight of tanks. To ensure that that was the case at Normandy, the Allies needed men to get over there and take samples of the sand. That happened six months before D-Day. Two men of the Royal Engineers travelled in a small boat to just off the Normandy coast. Armed with just a commando knife and a pistol, they swam to the shore. There, barely evading discovery by the Germans, they took samples of the sand and swam back to their boat. The sand was suitable. D-Day would happen at Normandy. With Normandy chosen as the landing location, the Allies could start on one of the most important parts of their strategy, to deceive the Germans as to where the assault would happen. The Allies pretended that they were going to attack in various different places. To feign an attack through Norway, they made a fake army in Scotland and produced false radio signals to look like a military build-up. There were even bombing raids on military and industrial targets. That deception might actually have fooled the Germans into thinking that an attack could happen there. Hitler kept 400,000 men in Scandinavia. The Allies also had a plan to convince the Germans that the invasion would come at Calais. That wasn't hard, since Calais was the obvious target. The Allies famously made the totally fictitious 1st United States Army Group, which was supposedly led by the famous American general, George Patton. Patton was the general that the Germans feared most. He was a fierce man that slapped his soldiers if they had shell shock. A huge effort went into the fake army. Dummy aircraft and tanks were used to fool the German reconnaissance planes. Entire buildings were built to make the army seem real. All that was backed up by some astonishing and frankly awesome spy work. The most famous story is that of the Spaniard Juan Pujol Garcia, codenamed Garbo. He so successfully convinced the Nazis that he was working for them that he was awarded the Iron Cross by Hitler. He had them believing that he was running a spy network of 27 spies in the UK, and many of his reports were read by Hitler personally. Garbo played a huge role in persuading the Germans that the attack would come at Calais. That was incredibly important and valuable for the Allies. Even after the landing at Normandy, the Nazis continued to believe that it was just a diversion and that the main attack would come afterwards at Calais. 22 divisions remained there for weeks after D-Day. Another major part of the plan was to soften up the German positions with a bombing campaign. The bombing started in June of 1943, a full year before D-Day itself. Of course, it increased dramatically as D-Day drew closer. In the two months leading up to D-Day, the Allies dropped almost 200,000 tonnes of bombs on France, more than 10 times what the Germans had dropped on London during the Blitz. One of the most important targets was the German Air Force. The Allies absolutely needed air supremacy on D-Day, so the German Air Force had to be totally crippled. Bombs were dropped on the airfields themselves, but also the factories and infrastructure that were producing the planes. That proved incredibly successful. On D-Day, the Germans had only 700 planes available to counter the Allies' 10,000. Another key target was radar stations. If the German radar stations were functioning, it would be much harder for the Allies to keep the location of the landing hidden. It would also allow them to respond much faster when the attack finally happened. 
The destruction of the radar stations was incredibly effective. By D-Day, almost all of the 92 radar stations had been destroyed. Along the Normandy coast, not a single one was working. The invasion itself was, of course, going to involve a huge number of different things all happening simultaneously. First, 24,000 paratroopers would be dropped inland just after midnight. They were there to capture various strategically important targets, certain bridges and roads. The main purpose of that was to hinder any potential German counterattack. At the same time, roughly 7,000 ships would leave the English coast and advance on Normandy. The naval operations alone required almost 200,000 men. With the sea around Normandy laced with mines, running ahead of the convoy were minesweepers. In fact, some of the first men to die were men on one of those minesweepers, which hit a mine and sank. Other ships were tasked with bombarding the shore fortifications to soften them up as much as they could before the men landed. Of course, a huge number of the ships were carrying the 150,000 men that would land on the beaches. The first men would land at about 6.30 a.m. and fight their way through the minefields and machine gun fire up the beach. The men would land at five different beaches, and ideally, by the end of the day, they would have joined up. Once the beachhead was established, huge numbers of reinforcements would be sent from England. Half a million men were waiting, ready to cross. One of the biggest challenges would then be how to supply such a large army. Absolutely everything that they needed, from ammunition to toilet paper and shaving equipment, would have to be shipped over from England. Now that would be much easier done with large ships that can carry a lot of cargo. However, large ships have the problem that they can't get too close to the beach. The normal solution to that problem is of course to use harbours. Harbours have two main characteristics. First, they have deep water right next to the land, which allows for large ships to get right up close to the dock. Second, they have barriers to break the waves and make the water in the harbour much calmer than in the open sea. Normandy didn't actually have any natural harbours. The closest was at the town of Sherbrooke, and there was no way of knowing when the Allies would be able to take it. That gave rise to one of the most astonishing parts of the D-Day plan. They were going to use enormous portable harbours which would be moved from England to France. They were called Mulberry Harbours and took tens of thousands of men months to create. So, if that was the plan, how were the Allied commanders holding up? Well, they were, as you would imagine, extremely stressed. For all that they had done everything they could to ensure success, they knew that there was a chance of failure. The British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, was very nervous. In a letter to the American President, FDR, he wrote, I do not doubt our ability to get ashore and deploy. I am, however, deeply concerned with the situation which may arise between the 13th and 16th days. My dear friend, this is much the greatest thing we have ever attempted. Britain's most senior military commander had significant doubts about the whole plan. He wrote, I am very uneasy about the whole operation. At best, it will fall short of the expectations of the bulk of people who know nothing of its difficulties. At worst, it may well be the most ghastly disaster of the whole war. The British Chief of Air Staff was also pessimistic. He was convinced that the paratrooper drop would be a complete failure and would see huge losses of men and aircraft. He repeatedly said that it would fail to Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander. That only added to Eisenhower's huge anxieties and made him question his own nerve and judgment. Eisenhower himself was so stressed that he was chain-smoking. The day before the invasion, he even wrote a speech that he would give in the case of failure. He wrote, Our landings have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time was based upon the best information available. The troops, the air and the navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. If the operation had failed, it's hard to overstate how much of a disaster it would have been. Part of that was because everyone could see the oncoming Cold War. By now it was clear that the USA and the Soviet Union were going to end up adversaries in a war for dominance over the globe. The Soviets were making fast progress into Europe from the east, and so the longer that the Allies took to invade the mainland, the more of Europe that would fall to communism. The absolute worst thing that could happen on D-Day would be that the troops didn't manage to secure a beachhead and were completely pushed back into the sea.
That would, of course, mean an astonishing loss of life. Tens of thousands of men would die. If that happened, the Germans would refortify, and it would be potentially a whole year until a new invasion could be attempted. That would give the Germans time to continue the bombing of England with their V1 and V2 rockets. Even more scary, it would give time to the Nazi plan to create a nuclear weapon. You have to remember it was very difficult for the Allies to know how close the Germans might be to achieving that. Another reason that D-Day couldn't fail was the sheer monetary cost of it. It had placed a huge strain on Allied resources. Roughly 2 million people were involved. That said, ensuring success was extremely difficult. The whole enormous operation needed to run like clockwork. The failure of one assault could affect the success of another. Every commander was keenly aware that any error that they made could cost lives. Any mistake could leave them with the blood of thousands of men on their hands. Potentially, their reputations would be ruined for the rest of their lives. For those men, many of whom had huge reputations and a great deal of fame, there was a lot to lose. So, what exactly were the Allied commanders worried about? What was it that was keeping them up at night? Well, with a plan as enormous and complicated as D-Day, it goes without saying that there was an almost infinite number of things that could go wrong. Had the Germans been successfully deceived about the location? Had they somehow found out where it would take place and fortified it more than the Allies knew? There really, really needed to be the absolute minimum number of German troops at Normandy in order for the plan to work. Another key worry was whether the Germans would be able to launch a devastating counterattack. Even if the beachheads were successfully made, the Allies would be vulnerable for days after the landings. If even a few tank divisions were able to get to the area within the first few days, they could make things extremely difficult. Another big worry was whether there were defences that they weren't aware of. For example, the Allies were very late in their discovery of the anti-tank mines under the water. That meant that at the last minute they had to change plan. They had to change the time that the attack would happen. Those mines meant that the Allies had to land at low tide, which meant landing two and a half hours later than they had initially planned. That then had to be changed again at one of the beaches when it was found that there were rocky shoals. There, they would have to land at half tide. One of the biggest worries for the Allies wasn't actually related to the Germans at all, but in fact something much more mundane. Something that has ruined so many plans throughout history, including some of my own birthdays. The English weather. The Allies were well aware that the weather was going to be one of the biggest factors determining their success. The air operations required clear skies. If there was cloud cover, the aeroplanes wouldn't be able to see where they were dropping their bombs and paratroopers. We can see that that was a valid concern from what actually happened on D-Day. At one of the beaches, cloud cover did lead to the paratroopers getting dropped in the wrong location. The weather was a source of immense stress for the planners. That's not only because they had absolutely no control over it, but also because it's impossible to forecast with certainty. The weather is unpredictable, and forecasting can only ever be probabilistic. What added to the stress of all that was the fact that there were only a few days per month that were suitable for the operation. The bombers needed a full moon in order to be able to see their targets. The tides also needed to be correct. That meant that if the weather conditions weren't correct on the few days that were suitable according to the moon and the tides, the whole operation would have to be delayed by weeks. That might not sound like such a bad thing, but it would have been a disaster. Hundreds of thousands of men were on tenterhooks waiting for it to happen. Many were waiting on incredibly cramped ships. Such a delay would have had a terrible effect on morale. Also, it would have been increasingly difficult to prevent the Germans from knowing where the attack was going to take place. Secrecy would have been hard to maintain. Luckily for the Allies, in the end, they didn't have to delay by weeks, but they did delay by a single day. D-Day was initially intended to happen on the 5th of June, but the 6th and 7th were also possibilities. After that, it wouldn't be possible for weeks. It came down to what the weather forecasters said. Head of the weather forecasting team was James Stagg. It was he that would tell Eisenhower when to go ahead. Stagg had one of the most stressful jobs of all the planners. He had to present Eisenhower with forecasts for all three days, but none of the forecasters in his team could agree on what the weather was likely to do for even one day. 
The other planners didn't seem to have much sympathy for Stagg's unenviable position of being held responsible for things that were to a large degree down to chance. When he arrived at the meeting to present Eisenhower with the forecasts, Eisenhower bluntly asked him, Well, Stagg, what have you got for us this time? Other men were even worse than that, bordering on the sadistic. One lieutenant said to him, Good luck, Stagg. Remember, we'll string you up from a lamppost if you don't read the omens right. At the meeting, Stagg said that the weather was going to get significantly worse on the 5th. When Eisenhower asked him what was going to happen on the 6th and 7th, he had to admit that he simply didn't know. On that advice, Eisenhower did decide to delay. D-Day wouldn't happen on the 5th. Given that Stagg had predicted that the weather would be bad, he was now in the position where if the weather wasn't bad, he would end up humiliated. He might have cost the Allies their best opportunity with his incorrect forecast. That actually looked like it might be the case. When Stagg woke up on the 4th, the sky was clear and there was little wind. Had he just cost the Allies their best moment? At breakfast, he couldn't face the other officers. Fortunately for Stagg's conscience, that didn't last. As the day went on, the weather did get very bad. Stagg had been right to advocate for the delay. Even so, the delay caused enormous problems. What would happen to the tens of thousands of men that were cramped up on their landing crafts? Surely they couldn't stay on them for 24 hours. Huge numbers of ships had been sent out that would have to be called back to refuel. Some of the small landing craft didn't even have radios, so they weren't contactable. Larger ships had to be sent out to shepherd them back. As you can imagine, with all those Allied ships dilly-dallying around Normandy, the risk of the Germans finding out about the attack was extremely high. If that happened and the Germans sent significant reinforcements to Normandy, the Allied forces could potentially be walking into a killing field with no hope of success. To add to the stress of that further, it wouldn't necessarily be possible for them to know if the Germans had found out. D-Day was now provisionally the 6th of June, but of course there was no guarantee that the weather would get better. On the evening of the 4th, Stagg was once again called to meet Eisenhower. At that point, things weren't looking good. Rain and wind were battering the windows. For the tens of thousands of men that were enduring that weather on cramped landing ships, that must have been absolute hell. At HQ, there was a depressed atmosphere. Things weren't looking good for the 6th. Stagg began to speak to the commanders. Gentlemen, since I presented the forecast yesterday, some rapid and unexpected developments have occurred over the North Atlantic. He went on to say that he thought there would be a slight improvement in the weather. It wouldn't be ideal, but it would be acceptable. Fervent discussion immediately broke out. The head of naval forces exclaimed that if D-Day was going to happen on the 6th, he had to let his forces know within the next half an hour. He also said that if they prepared for the 6th and it didn't happen, he wouldn't be able to do it on the 7th. The next morning, the morning of the 5th, the forecasting data continued to look better. Stagg was able to say with more certainty that the weather would be acceptable. The decision was taken. D-Day would happen on the 6th. Now, they just had to pray that the forecast would turn out to be accurate. In the end, the weather turned out okay. It didn't cause huge problems. That said, it did cause enough problems to show that the planners were totally right to be worried about it. There was some cloud cover which caused problems. That meant that the bombers at Omaha Beach were unable to see their targets and missed them. 1,700 tons of bombs were dropped without killing a single person. The naval bombardment of the coastal defences suffered a similar problem and caused a lot less damage than had been hoped. The poor visibility also caused problems for the paratroopers. The clouds meant that the planes carrying the paratroopers couldn't fly in a tight formation and so many of the paratroopers were dropped far from their intended landing zones. Many planes came in so low that they were under fire from both flak and machine gun fire. Some paratroopers were killed on impact when their parachutes didn't have time to open and others drowned in the flooded fields. So the weather was one of the biggest worries for the Allies, but of course far from the only one. Another major worry was whether the troops would even be able to overcome the defences. As they made their way off the landing craft and up the beaches, they would be extremely vulnerable. Would it be the case that the men all just got mown down by machine gun fire and pushed back into the sea? It was expected that the casualty rate would be about 30%, which would mean about 50,000 men in a single day. Don't forget that for the Allies, every death counted. They didn't fight like, for instance, Russia, where lives were treated as expendable. 
It was the duty of the commanders to do absolutely everything they could to minimise casualties as much as possible. It wasn't just about whether the operation was successful, it was about whether they personally had been an honourable commander. A mistake that had men die would haunt them for the rest of their lives. In the end, this was actually an area where the Allies worried more than they needed to. While they predicted a casualty rate of 30%, the actual figure was about 8%. Some beaches were worse than others. The worst by far was Omaha, where 2,000 men died. The situation was so bad that the Allies were even considering evacuating Omaha at one point. Thankfully, that wasn't necessary. The beachheads were successfully made, with relatively few casualties. That said, the Allies didn't actually achieve the objectives that they were hoping to on day one. They were hoping that the five beaches could be joined up into one single front, and that didn't happen for several days. One of their most important objectives was to take the town of Conn. That was particularly important because it was a road hub, and so any German counterattack was likely to go through there. A strong counterattack was another of the major worries for the Allies. After all, even if they successfully secured a beachhead, it would be very vulnerable for several days. They were aware that the Germans had 10 panzer divisions stationed around Paris, that is, about 2,000 tanks. If they could get to Normandy fast, they might be able to push the Allies back into the sea. Essentially, it would be a race. The Allies had to get as many men and tanks onto the beachhead as they could before the German panzers arrived, which they thought would take five days. For that reason, the panzers had to be slowed and obstructed as much as possible on their journey to Normandy. To that end, one of the main tasks of the paratroopers was to blow up bridges. The French resistance was also going to be involved in that. In the end, the Allies actually had a big ace up their sleeves that they couldn't have been aware of. The incompetence of this absolute fruitcake. The 2,000 tanks around Paris were actually only allowed to move with the express permission of Hitler. Without his authority, they couldn't do anything. What made that even more of a problem for the Germans was that Hitler was a late riser. He woke up late and didn't like to be woken unnecessarily. Even as D-Day was in progress, nobody dared wake him up. That day he awoke at noon, almost 12 hours after the start of the invasion. Even then he didn't act fast. The panzers around Paris weren't sent until about 4pm. Even then, they had to go extremely slowly because it was now daytime, so they were vulnerable to Allied bombing. They couldn't really get going until dusk. Those panzers didn't join the battle for two whole days, which was an enormous blessing for the Allies, giving them extremely valuable time. By that time, they had more than enough forces in Normandy to fight them off. With the Allies established at Normandy, the defeat of Hitler was one step closer to being realised. As we all now know, D-Day and the liberation of France was eventually a success. It would take a huge number of lives, but eventually the Nazi Empire would fall. That said, it's important to remember that it wasn't always a given. If some things had gone differently, maybe we would remember D-Day as one of the greatest disasters in military history. Thankfully, that's not what happened. If you would like to learn about how Germany came to terms with what it had done during the Holocaust, please do subscribe because I'm currently making a video about that and it will be uploaded soon. Thanks so much for watching.